I have, I have a hard time thinking we're really persecuted because people said mean things to us on Twitter. Um, I don't, I don't have Twitter. Uh, perhaps it, it frees me from feeling the tension of being persecuted with people saying mean things, but it just doesn't feel like a persecution. My name is Jason Craig. Uh, welcome back to the Till and Keep podcast, uh, where we talk a lot about the, the economics and the reality of home life, the intersection of all those things uh, like work, leisure, productivity, consumption, materials, technology. Uh, but of course, all podcasts or a lot of them claim to be talking about the intersection of these things. We're really drilling down uh, very often with uh, the father his role in ordering the family and how very often, uh, you know, we, we talk about whether or not politics are downstream of culture or culture downstream of politics or technology downstream of this or that. Um, the reality is that the, the father is downstream of all of it. Do we still have Tom Thomas? You're still there. Okay. Um, and the father has a, a particular role of leading the family. And a lot of times we think about that only in the form of um, sort of emotional support or even just financial funding, uh, not in the sense of he's, he's really ordering or that his something like his work or his view and reality of economics actually shapes the culture of the home. We tend to think of him as a lawgiver and sometimes a negative sense instead of law in the classical sense, meaning, you know, bring, bringing order to something, not just not just limiting the freedom of something, but ordering something that's good. And that's that's uh, his job. So today um, I'm really excited to have with us Thomas Stork, uh, who uh, there's a number of books that I've read uh, or, or excerpts, and he's kind of contributed in lots of places when it comes to this very idea of of economics. Uh, he recently had a book called The Prosperity Gospel, uh, which I read, it, it was wonderful. I, it sort of begins in some of the the economic realities of things and ends in everything from artwork and how we view culture. And, and it's really great. Um, but the reason, Thomas, I'd like to have you on uh, is I think, I mean, my experience um, as uh, sort of in the, I don't know, um, conservative American male father, space, uh, it seems that we there's a lot of really identifiable sins and vices and disorders that are fun to laugh at. Uh, everything from transgenderism and other wokenesses uh, that are that are really easy to, to recognize as as errors or deadly or poisonous. In fact, they're laughably so we can almost they're almost not perhaps as threatening as we think they are or or we'll complain about uh, our, you know, uh, I, have, I have a hard time thinking we're really persecuted because people said mean things to us on Twitter. Um, I don't I don't have Twitter. Uh, perhaps it, it frees me from feeling the tension of being persecuted with people saying mean things, but it just doesn't feel like a persecution. So there's lots of little things that we can point at. But I, I would say w when I'm talking to fathers and we get to the brass tacks of certain things, the one of our sacred cows that we're not really willing to slaughter um, is actually in the world of money and how we think about money and success. And I think there's a particularly underlying, whether we like it or not, American thread in our even Calvinist backgrounds. And, and whereas, you know, God is reward. The reason we're rich as a country or as people is because God has blessed us for our good actions um, in our, in our goodwill. And that's why we have stuff. Um, and I don't, I don't know how we would think about the Holy family or, you know, other impoverished saints, but they, you know, they, some they didn't have that we now have that God has rewarded. Uh, so that's what I wanted to ask you about today. So how did you get into it? It seems as if you've written quite extensively on this, uh, your book, um, from Christendom to Americanism and beyond this, this book, the prosperity gospel, uh, how did you sort of fall into this line of study and thought when it, when it comes to how we think about money and God's reward and, and how to live life? Well, it started back when I was in high school, actually, a long, long time ago. Um, when I was, I wasn't really, even though my family was church going, I wasn't really raised as a Christian or expected to be a Christian. So during high school, I first came to believe in God and then moved toward being a Christian and then 
some years later, 10 years later, a Catholic. But um, I read at that time Richard Tony's very famous book, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, which mm -hmm. talked about medieval uh, economic morality, how the church had a very robust doctrine of, of economic morality during the Middle Ages. And I thought, gee, this, this accords with some of the things that I'm hearing around me from surprising voices that aren't necessarily uh, Protestants or Catholics. And um, so uh, I started studying more and then eventually I discovered the papal social encyclicals and um, the, the immense secondary works that talk about them. And um, and that's been a, one of my compelling interests since then. And it, and it goes along with the idea of another interest of mine is of, of a Catholic culture. Anyway, a Catholic culture is gonna be more than just having beautiful churches and processions, important as those are, it's going to mean that Catholicism permeates every aspect of our life, our, our economics, our art, our politics, our family life, uh, you name it. Hmm. And a lot of Catholics in the United States have not realized the necessity to for the faith to live itself out as a cultural thing, not, not in the sense of Sometimes people use the word cultural Catholic to mean somebody who's, oh yeah, I'm a Catholic because my I'm Italian or whatever. That's not what I mean by cultural Catholic. I mean a Catholic whose faith permeates not just their individual life, but their family life, and insofar as possible, their whole social life, their whole civic life, uh, which is what we should be aiming for. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting. I, I think I, I've tried to. I, I'm a convert as well. Um, I think we probably share similar interests in, you know, uh, Christopher Dawson or, you know, these students of Catholic culture as it was. And, you know, I see these websites and things that like we're going to restore Christendom. And um, the more I learn about Christendom and how they thought about things, the more we're, we don't deserve Christendom. I mean, they they really gave serious thought, um, not just on. Um, yeah, processions and churches, which they did. But how does the gospel actually affect like interest rates and um, uh, low in business and profits and families and arrangements? And uh, I mean, they, and whether or not you think they were efficient or good, maybe maybe there's some debate there or you could. Um, but you cannot say that God wasn't the center of what they were doing. And for us, it's, we, we don't deserve it because when we when we say things like we're, well, we're going to restore Christendom on, you know, on our websites, um, something about that seems sad and laughable to me. And then I realize I think when we think of culture as Americans, we actually think of branding. Uh, that we're, we're kind of branding ourselves with the bumper stickers and the accoutrements of what it looks like. Uh, we're sharing the correct memes where uh, we've got the t shirts, we've got the bumper stickers, we're, we're going to mass and, and we're, right, we're listening to the right podcasts and Till and Keep, of course. Uh, we're watching the right YouTube channels. We're sharing their, you know, all that is it's sort of branding and positioning, whereas it actually doesn't really affect the the order. It just affects how we consume things and what we're wearing and putting on. Like it just kind of right. like buying things. You, know, you will probably recall the late Cardinal George about twenty five years ago said that American Catholics were cultural pro cultural Calvinists. Yeah, and that was a very insightful comment of his. And and when the huge Catholic immigration in the 19th and early 20th century came, they came to a country that was already a bastion of Protestantism, kind of Protestant in its mores, its institutions, its ways of thinking, its educational system. And most Catholic, Catholic the church was fighting just to uh, hold her own, just to preserve her members from uh, drifting away from the faith, which was not always that successful in the 19th century. And um, it was, difficult for Catholic at the time to undertake the gigantic project, which they didn't really fully realize or maybe realize much at all that it needed to be done, the gigantic project of converting the culture as such. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had various people like, say, Archbishop Ireland of St. Paul or Cardinal Gibbons, who were actually opposed to the idea of doing that. They they welcomed Americanism. Americanism. Uh, they wanted Catholics to conform as much as possible to the Protestant mores where that didn't explicitly uh, violate some tenet of the faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't understand that the faith was more than just uh, what you read in the Baltimore Catechism, important and 
vital as that is. Uh, it, it shapes our whole way of life. So speaking of Catholics, we've always had this tendency to conform to the Protestant milieu that surrounds us. And this has especially gotten, this has gotten worse since the 1960s, since the council, where discipline in the church has pretty much broken down. And if Catholics are looking for a, um, some kind of a cultural identity in the United States, they don't even realize that there is a Catholic cultural identity waiting for them if they would only uh, know where to look for it. So where do they look instead? They look at one of the two political cultural blocks that America is basically divided into, which we call conservative and liberal. Those names are problematic enough, but um, I'll use them because that's what everybody does and it would be stupid to kind of to try not to. Um, so we have the conservative block, which is, as far as economic teachings, is actually just a kind of a leftover form of 19th century liberalism. Because liberalism, which has been uh, a revolt, a slow revolt against Christian Christendom since the 16th century, changes its teachings, as it were, it's changing its views every 150 years, whatever. Uh, so, for example, in the early 19th century, liberals were at the forefront of the free market. They wanted to free people from the restrictions that the guilds and the Catholic monarchs had imposed upon people. Let's, let's be dynamic in the economy, people like Adam Smith, David Ricardo. And so liberalism in the early 19th century was very much in favor of the free market. By the, about 100 years later, liberalism began to change and now saw that the, uh, the free market needed restrictions. And liberalism, say on free speech liberalism, used to be very absolutist on free speech. Now the more advanced liberals are openly advocating restrictions on speech that they don't like. So liberalism is a, is a very protean uh, uh, movement. It doesn't really have any principles except uh, wanting to throw off shackles, whatever shackles seems to be fascinated at the moment and wants to get rid of. But the problem is that the conservatives in the United States have latched on to a 19th century form of liberalism, which includes, a, as I said, a very <clears throat> robust defense of free markets. And those Catholics who identify as conservatives, and most of them don't know much about the Catholic, Catholic papal social teaching. And those who do will sometimes actually reject it because for them, this conservative, really 19th century liberal, but conservative um, worldview trumps their Catholic worldview, at least when it comes to social economic things. And that's why I, I think it's, I have written before in the past, it is so vital, but it, no one seems to <laughs> agree with me on this. It is so vital to jettison these terms and say, what do you think about things? Well, not to say I'm a conservative, no, I'm a Catholic. And my views on things flow as far as I can determine them, as far as I can make them. They flow from the central teachings of the Catholic faith. And they, they, whether that be on the family, on um, issues of life, on issues of money, on issues of foreign policy, whatever, I ought to make my views consonant with the church's teaching. Right. I'm not sure if you had it in this in this book, or, or, or I, but it does seem that our terms, conservative and liberal, as we use them in this country, are they're just two sides of the same coin, which is liberalism. They're just different forms because they actually don't take um, as much as all the rhetoric comes out. They they don't take things like God and the family as actually the center of our life. Um, and this comes out all the time. I, I uh, uh, the, the example I use, because a lot of people have read some of the little house books, uh, the little house on the prairie. And, and then the, uh, um, and there's one, it's I can't, the long winter, I think it's called something like that. And Almanzo, who's one of the main characters that's in one of the other books. And he marries Laura Ingalls. Um, Almanzo finds out that there's a farmer who has a storehouse of grain out and he's out and, and, and they're going to go talk to him about buying it. And, and when they, when he gets there and this this heroic journey through this, like just blistering cold and everyone's dying in the village, they're starving to death because there's no food This blizzard has just blocked. And he gets there and um, they're having this discussion as two liberals. I mean, they, you know, the, we think of the culture that they had 
as being, and there are things about it that are, that are conservative and good and family centric and hard work. Like there is, there's obviously good in there. We would be repulsed by it, but the place where it's sort of, they don't see their own is when he's trying to persuade this guy to um, sell the grain, which he has an excess of sell it, not even give it, sell it to the village that's starving to death. Um, he, he won't because they didn't plan well enough. And the, and then Almanza, who's come to get this grain, he's like, ah, he basically is like, I see your point. <laughs> and in this instance where the the care of one's neighbor would obviously necessarily, so Aquinas would teach in that moment that actually those goods become, and we're, we're scared to say these things. I mean, people love to talk about Aquinas and traditional teaching and all that until it actually matters. Um, because Aquinas would say in those instances, when, when an extreme necessity that those goods actually become common because that's how God ended God intended yeah, they would have a right to take it if the uh, <laughs> owner refused to sell it to them. Because, but we we actually have a hard time as conservative American men. We actually have a hard time with that, a really hard time. Because we, we, we. I, I mean, I can feel it. I'm knowing the truth. I'm trying to have a conversion here in my gut of sight. Well, it's his. It's his. I mean, what are you going to do? Take it? What are you going to do? Redistribute it? Is that who you, you know? Uh, so. I just use this as an example because often, even even conservatives, they don't have arguments uh, against things like pornography. If the free market, if people want it, they can have it. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of um, ways that they're not willing to think about law as bringing right order to society like the church would teach. And, and they only think of it in terms of we need less. So we think of law as, as imposing a restriction on the individual. And, and we don't think of law as the, the way a father, when a father makes a rule in a house, he's not limiting freedom. He's bringing order to the house. Um, and w we have a hard time thinking about law in that way because we've been conditioned to just, and now I'm actually, I'm happy. I, I, I'm happy to have that impulse. A lot of times I'm happy to have fought back in some of the madness during COVID. And, and uh, there, there's times where that helps us. Um, but there's, there's some underlying assumptions that are not, that aren't just sort of uh rugged in the good way, but just rugged in the, in the, in, a, in an ultimately evil way. Yeah. The, um, this actually goes back to the, um, philosophy of John Locke. And I've, I've mentioned that in the, in the book that you mentioned from Christendom to Americanism, I talk about Locke and in other places I've talked about Locke. Locke uh, was an English philosopher who died in, uh, I think 1704, very early in the 18th century. And he posited that the people, individual human beings, individual men, who are by nature separate. Our, our natural state is a state of nature. And when we come into society and into a political order, we're limiting our freedom. We're, to, we're limiting something that's actually natural to us in exchange for, for obvious goods like protection and uh, cooperation and that kind of thing. But uh, this Lockean view has been is deeply, deeply ingrained in the American psyche. And it's wrong because we're not, as you said about the family, we're not limiting ourselves by um, uh, coming into a political community. So Aquinas is quite clear, the natural state of man is to live in the community, following Aristotle, he said this. And um, it's, not, it's not a limitation on our freedom. It's um, uh, a guidance of our freedom and a fulfillment of our nature. Now, um, this Lockean view has colored our, our attitude toward government. So, oh, the government wants to do a thing, it must be bad. It must be a limitation of freedom. They won't, they'll screw it up. Um, well, yeah, sometimes government does screw things up, but people screw things up all the time. Um, so, this, this, but John Locke is really the, the essential thinker here who is, has an amazing influence on somebody called the historian Lewis Hart so that Locke was a national cliche in the United <laughs> States. His thinking is just taken for granted. And uh, the, idea that, we, the idea that the purpose of government is to secure our rights. Well, no, not really. The purpose of government is to bring us to virtue and ultimately to heaven. Uh, not that the government does it directly the way the church does, but the government sets the um, framework, as it were, by in which we can live virtuous lives and right. um, and it i think a, a helpful way is that there there are times where in fact so the, 
It's like the, the government is there. It's doing something. Now, there are times we wish it was doing less or something different, but it's it's active. And the way that we understand it and it understands us, right? Are we radical individuals? Or I mean, because this is a huge tussle right now in the culture wars. Are Is America made up of families, right? Or is America made up of just radical individuals? And for some, the family itself is a hindrance to personal. Yeah, you know, the, the family is the basic unit prior to the state. But the political community, the state is the natural home of mankind and the remedy for bad government is good government not no government right. it's like right. a remedy for an abusive father is not remove the father but convert the father right uh, when, yeah, i think so, it's uh, in joseph pierce's book uh, small is still beautiful which is a, the, the play on the uh, the schumacher small is beautiful yeah uh, he, he traces and because the government is doing something and it's it, like you said it's not whether it's there or not it's whether it's good or bad uh and the example he uses is breweries that because of uh go, you know government well first of all because of the the use of government to outlaw alcohol prohibition uh it it stifled, you know, a lot of breweries naturally shut down. Only a few survived. And on the other side of it, they had a bit of a monopoly. Um, it actually took uh, people reordering, not just not just uh, getting rid of, uh, not just retracting government at, altogether, but actually reordering things like regulation and actually making the market truly free. Whereas those of us, there's, there's some amongst us that would have just defended, well, the reason uh, Anheuser-Busch or whatever, the reason they're huge is because they're better. Which is, was absolutely not true, and the, it was actually it was the the government the laws on the books, along with the sheer power and the force of these giant breweries that stopped. Other and now we have this. I live in Western North Carolina, so you know there's a new brewery every week here, and it's thanks to uh, a proper ordering of the laws around the production of beer and alcohol that have allowed this to happen. So it's not just less laws, although you know that can be removing onerous or unjust laws is like uh, no no one's arguing for that. Um, but we have a hard time saying, no, the government does need to do something to make things better. Yeah, well, every law has a worldview behind it. You know, uh, the most minimalist law, the most maximalist law, every law has a worldview behind it and and, and, and forces some vision of right and wrong. And, uh, but as far as the free market is concerned, we've got to be careful to not to regard that as the, as the gold standard because as Price 11 says in uh, Guess Law Auto, the, um, the free market, the, the concept that free competition should be the ruling principle in, in, um, in the economy is false. He, he says it's, he compares it to a polluted spring that's polluted uh, our thinking. So um, the, 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 that it doesn't necessarily, this is one of the problems we have today is that people say, oh, so you're, you, don't, you want the government to control everything. No, no, no. Uh, the, the middle, the medieval Christendom order that we were talking about earlier, that, that that thought long and hard about how to make social life Christian, we realized that there were intermediate groups, like, for example, guilds uh, that were the influence, and they played a tremendous role in regulating the economy for the common good. They weren't directly uh, controlled by the central government. Uh, they were uh, private associations with public responsibilities, and right. they. And there's this is really a quintessentially Catholic approach to it. It's, it's a brilliant solution, actually, of the problem of economic regulation, not by the central state, less even less by the um, by the uh, individual, uh, because there you have economic power, and so you have these intermediate groups that are able to do a lot of the economic regulation. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated with how often um, rerum novarum comes up in discussions of, of social order. And then, um, and then Pius XI and his, his encyclical and the commemoration of it. Um, but people rarely talk about, you know, they, they get into socialism, capitalism, bit, individual state, communism, all of these discussions. And everyone seems to forget how Rerum Navarum ends, which it's pretty practical. Uh, what he calls for as far you know, he goes through all these social ills that will come from the state being in control of everything or, or just absolute free market, you know, capital being in charge of everything. He goes through all the disorders. And his recommendation is the family and these intermediary bodies of the guilds, that if the family as its own household uh, within itself, as the church teaches, is incomplete, right? Meaning the, 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 the family is an imperfect society. 
Um, not, not, that it, and that doesn't have to do with the levels of perfection. It has to do with, it doesn't is, does not have everything it needs to be itself. And the way we know that is my daughter, my oldest daughter, if she becomes married, if she get grows up, she can't marry anyone in the family, right? We have needs outside of the family. We, we, the family needs other families and that that's actually, that's our first step into politics and government and the, the church from Rome Navarum to now, well, you know, mostly uh, is proposing that it's not whether it's not the power sharing between the individual business or government. Those are like our only metrics. Uh, it's it's the family and then the local intermediary bodies that had the equivalent in the in the uh, in Christendom in the guilds, which had real and actual power. Even I mean, even with the church, I mean, had huge influence with uh, even even with clergy and and, and religious orders and. Uh, you know, the layman bemoan not having any any power, but they're they're not really re- uniting. And I actually think we're limited in uniting ourselves because the guilds um, and I can't remember the author of this book, but it really woke me up to it. The, the art of solidarity in the Middle Ages was the name of it. And he just shows how the guilds were willing to need and depend and rely and be accountable to one another in ways that were binding. I mean, they were binding like a family. Um, yeah, the, and the fundamental principle there, which is really the fundamental principle of Catholic thinking about economics, is that the economy has a purpose. It's not just there, uh, and for you to use it the way you want, for me to use it the way I want, and maybe I want to get rich and you want to help the poor, and so, okay, fine, they're equivalent, there's your personal will. No, the economy has a purpose to supply us with the external goods we need uh, and services so that we can spend our life on what's more important, the family intellectual life, spiritual life, ultimately getting to heaven. And um, so when you have an end, a purpose, uh, you're, I'm sure you're, sure you're familiar with the principle that the purpose determines everything. The, as Aristotle said, you decide on your purpose first and that makes you, that, that determines everything else in the end. If I want to get to the next town, then I, and I know I have to go in that direction. I can't just head the opposite direction. The, the purpose of where I'm going is what determines all the features of my journey. And similarly with the economy, if we know what the economy exists for, then we can say, okay, these are the features that ought to have. Uh, it, ought, it ought to foster the family, not destroy the family by uh, pulling people in different ways and making people work too much and uh, having people work on Sunday and so on and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. So what would you say... That- the only question I thought I would, I would it seems that the medievals in their guilds that they actually saw the sanctification of their economy less severed from the spiritual reality. I mean, they saw these things and obviously we can sanctify, but they're sort of, they had less, um, you know, just breathing in and out. The old or at labor was just breathing in and out of the same life. Um, what would, so the, the, these, this conversation can seem quite easily and it's esoteric, meaning how do we ground this? Not to get, I don't, I don't want easy ways to make, you know, to bring back Christendom or anything like that. But when it comes to the economics of the home, uh, is there, um, and, and also I think I'd like to ask you about the blind spot where the way that we think about money, because we're talking about how to ground this at home. This might sound like, oh, this is all just a lot of talk about power sharing and money. All this It doesn't really affect me, but. It actually does, because when we wake up, why we're working, you know, and wh- why we think we need more money or, or why we're stressing about not having enough of it uh, is affected by what the purpose, what we think our money's for. And, and you bring up in this book that we tend to th- in, in, uh, in the book, The Prosperity Gospel, um, that we think of money as a reward. Is that part of the that's part of the Calvinist thinking, or and then my follow up question? So explain that to me, and then also how how does this affect your average dad? I mean, if you've given that kind of some of that thought, is how, how does this affect? How do these economic realities and, and the way Americans view this? How is this affecting us in our home life? Well, we don't. If, if money, of course, is just a, a a surrogate, as it were, for external goods. I mean, money in itself, I can't eat it, I can't wear it, I can't, it doesn't keep me warm. I guess I could burn a lot of currency, keep myself warm for a little while. But uh, um, it doesn't really, it, it's a surrogate for external goods. So the real question is, what are the purpose, what is the purpose of external goods? And 
God does, God does expect us to use external goods. He made us in such a way that we need them. And human cultural life is uh, made better by certain external goods. But there's a limit on that. It's not just I want as much as I want because I want it. So, for example, um, house, house size in the United States, as in average house size, has increased since around 1970. Well, average family size has fallen. That makes absolutely no sense at all. Um, so uh, let's say let's take a couple. Let's take two, a husband and wife. Well, how big a house do they really need? Uh, some people need a big house. They might have businesses at home and that kind of thing. But there is a limit you can eat, uh, as to what is reasonable to have as a house size. And if if your if your house is gigantic, some you know you might want to ask yourself, why do I want this house? Is it to impress the neighbors? Is it to uh, uh, impress my family or whatever? But it, it's really irrational. It's like having a pair of shoes twice the size you need because uh, you can show I can afford a big pair of shoes or my my uh, pants, my shirt are, are twice the size I need. It, it just doesn't, it just makes no sense at all. So um, we have to put goods, material goods in their place as servants of human life not as masters, not as goals, but simply as means to an end. And the end is what counts, not the means uh, to the end. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done, depending on, but circumstances are different so much. There's a lot of things that can be done, for example, in families where the, uh, is, the, the uh, husband is fortunate enough to be able to earn a, a, a living wage, and uh, so his wife can stay at home and take care of the children, then she can do a lot in terms of of genuine cooking instead of getting fast food stuff all the time uh, and and even even maybe gardening and growing some of their own food and the children that's something the children can help out in it's um all those kinds of things but again it depends on the right order if the, if a husband can't make enough money if he can't make a living wage then that destroys the part of the integrity of the family so it's you see here how the um the economy is directly linked to family life. So one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest um, frauds perpetrated on the American people was in the early '80s when the corporations took advantage of the feminists and and said, "Yeah, women want to work outside the home." And uh, and what did it enable to do? It destroyed family life and enabled corporations to lower wages because now they could get uh, a family. Uh, could get they could get two people working for the price of one or a little bit over one say, so right. uh, it was a real fraud that they perpetrated on the uh, on the public. Yeah, it's interesting how uh, uh, you know the, the defense of unions now is the, how different they were from the Catholic un the, you know the unions and that the church supported early on for the working wage of the father uh, would never have supported. Um, encouraging or bringing in the the wives to essentially compete for wages with their own husbands for the maintenance of the same family because everyone loses except the corporation in that case because the husband makes less the wife makes less the family uh, is no longer cohesive because no one's at home uh, and the children are the, the, and then we've realized the marxist dream of now that the only thing to do with the children is to hand them over to the state uh, and uh, the only one, the only one benefiting is the corporation itself. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. But one of the one of the first things we can do to is is order our start to order our thinking correctly. And maybe if we abandon calling ourselves conservatives and start to call ourselves, well, I'm just Catholic, uh, that would be a first step. Because really, what you should ask somebody if you're a conservative, what do you want to conserve? Yeah, and if you say, well, Catholicism, well, then why don't you call yourself a Catholic? Um, just like progressives, you had, well, what do you want to progress? What are you trying to progress toward? And um, most of them would not know what to say. Right. Um, but they say God. Right. Some of the, uh, in, in, I think in the late, in the 50s, Frank Meyer, who was one of the fusionist conservatives, uh, conservatism is trying to conserve freedom. Well, I think a lot of people would agree with that, but it's wrong because freedom is not the highest uh, political good. Justice is. And uh, freedom is a good in its place, sure. But uh, in and of itself is a means to an end. 
And I don't, I, I just, that, that doesn't hold water. The moment we start again, thinking of the family as the center, any, any parent, any half decent parent knows that if the family is, you know, our goal really is the health of the family. There's nothing more limiting to my freedom than my family. My freedom is at everything good in my life from my marriage to my children, to my milk cows, everything that I enjoy and I love is a limitation to my freedom. Uh, so I can't, of, of course, I would like us to be, I would like to be able to be free to be a husband, to be a father, to milk my cows, um, to enjoy what, you know, talking and thinking with my own friends. And of course that, that's, but, but when we just say freedom in the abstract, we can do, you know, we can do whatever we want. We just call it freedom and we can do whatever we want. That's the freedom of Satan who right. is unwilling to submit to his uh, created position as a pretty high ranking angel because he wanted what? He wanted disordered freedom. He wanted to be able to do whatever he wanted. Right. And that's the, uh, I, I, I do, I think it's in the background here, not the, the, the liturgy of the land book. There it is. Um, my friend, Tommy and I, that's what we did. Um, about 12 years ago, we started homesteading and we just wrote this book together because, and the, the thing that we, we laugh about is when people accuse us, we, or they, they, uh, romanticize what we're trying to do out in the country and milking our cows. And he, he raises bees and, um, is they think of us as sort of like radical pioneer freedom spirited, which in some ways is true, but there's nothing less freeing than having a homestead. It grounds us. But the, the reason that we do it is actually the, that, that limitation makes us truly free to just be fully human with our family, to do the work. It sort of orients all our, it's the dominant economic reality around us meaning because we're actually growing. We need it. We need the food. Um, and it supplies our needs directly and it brings us all together. And this is a very practical, actionable thing um, that people, they think, well, that's so romantic. And I, and I laugh, I'm like, that is literally the most practical thing. <laughs> that's not practical. Like, I just cannot think of something more practical than a hog in the backyard. I don't know why that gets labeled as impractical, whereas modern banking, we cannot question because that would be impractical. I, don't, I mean, I, I don't understand um, the, 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 the revulsion to things that are truly very practically good for our family and our economy. Well, it's, it's the, when you start thinking the way you have to the roots of things and reasoning back to first principles, then you're going to come up with different solutions from what most people have. And they're going to seem odd, romantic, whatever, but they're, they're really just basing things on first principles. And, you know, if I have a family, the family needs this, I need to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, if you're, but if you're fed since the fourth grade that the highest good is to save enough money to, to uh, retire early, um, then yeah, that, that's sort of the end we're all pursuing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I, I glossed over this question because it was my fault because I asked like four questions instead of one. Um, Speak a little bit about the, uh, cause I come from an evangelical background and a Calvinist background. Um, don't worry. I've repented. Um, the, the underlying thought though, for us is that, uh, I think one of the reasons we buy big houses or enjoy big flashy lives without embarrassment, right? I mean, Catholics of a certain time would have been less ostentatious, or if you were ostentatious, it's something I learned from Mark Barnes over at New Polities. You know, the reason that the rich had to wear certain hats is actually marked to them as rich, meaning you can expect from them the duties of the rich would be like the support of the church and things like that. But ours is a little more just flamboyant, uh, that it's actually a sign of uh, our favor with God. Is that, uh, yeah, so just speak a little bit. What, what do you mean by that? Well, and then when you go back to Calvinism, where uh, God has chosen uh, so in some versions, even before the fall, and other versions after the fall, has chosen certain people to be saved and certain people to be damned. And there's nothing they can do about that. It's not a matter of their conduct or their faith, even. Uh, they're going to, if you're a Israeli, you're like a robot, really. Uh, there's no drama in, in the salvation whatsoever. And so, one of the ways you know that you are among the elect, among those whom God chose to save, is prosperity in the world. And even though most Americans would reject this right now, 
it's kind of a we have a secularized version of it. So if I if I've done well economically, then that means that must mean I'm I'm I've done something right. I'm smart. Uh, something's helped me. Maybe karma. They would say now. I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, in any case, you you've done well, and the poor man is struggling as in as in the floor when the uh, Iowa books you brought up a minute ago. Uh, they didn't plan well. I've actually seen somebody defending Ebenezer Scrooge in, in Dickens' Christmas Carols as saying, well, Bob Cratchit didn't, didn't, just didn't plan well. <laughs> uh, he, he should have known before he got married and had children that, he, that his income was limited. And instead of any kind of solidarity between Scrooge and, and Cratchit, Bob Cratchit, uh, this, this writer was just saying Cratchit was a loser. Uh, and to add, but that's the way it was. And, and, and instead of looking on human society as a band of brothers, we look upon human society as a band of, oh, as a, a band of cats, as somebody said, fighting each other, trying to get ahead. And this is, this is a profoundly un-Catholic view of um, the social order. Yeah. And one that uh, we really have to work against at every level. And, and, and Catholics who, who pride themselves on their orthodoxy uh, it's not just a matter of, I mean, I would never, ever downplay the slightest adherence to the church's uh, doctrinal and personal moral teachings. Those are absolutely essential. But also essential are the adherence to the church's social teachings and, and the whole total milieu that the church has fostered. Pope Pius XI, in his first encyclical, um, said at the end of the encyclical, he said, and this came just maybe 10, 15 years after the modern crisis. He said, people who re reject the Catholic social teaching, he called them social modernists. And he said, I, I reject this as vehemently as I do dogmatic modernism. Hmm. And um, that's, pretty, that's a pretty firm and clear statement. Yeah, it does. I think if we, if we examine ourselves closely, though, even the divides in the church, it's those that, I mean, if you, if you kind of scratch the surface, those are the two forms of modern, just as in America, we talk about liberalism, the two sides of the coin, conserv so-called conservatives, so-called liberals. Uh, they're both libertines, liber you know, liberalism uh, in the church. It, it, very often, if you scratch the surface, depending on the, the, the circles you're in, it's either we tend towards the modernism of against the social teaching or we're ultra modernists with dogmatic teaching. I mean, it's like we we pick one or the other and we're divided in those places. And I actually I find you know, me personally, I just, I fully assented. I, I find the dogmatic teaching easier. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something it's right, it's right there in the script. We could argue. It's just good old fashioned arguments. And, but I think in the social and the public life, because it actually affects how we treat and think about one another. For example, you use the word competition. I think we're conditioned to think of one another as competitors, as we, as there, as God has made the world such that it is limited in, whether it be honor, right, or or, or uh, tomatoes, right? There's a limitation, and I have to get more of it, which is opposed to the gospel that we that if we die, we and I think of the uh, my sons and I were having the discussion. I'm, I, I'm encouraging one of them in their homeschool is just he's learning propagation, and I want him to see that this this plant we're taking cuttings, we're pruning the plant, and we're growing more of this plant, and by using compost and working with the natural thing that actually the, the more we do, the more fruitful everything around us is becoming without depleting anything. That's actually, we don't live as if that's true. And I mean that socially, I mean, in our interactions with one another, if, and this is where it comes to envy and jealousy. If one person is honored and I'm forgotten there, something has been diminished from me. And, and this is, um, it's bigger than I think we're willing to think about. And it comes back down to, do we think of one another as you use the word brothers, right? Do we think of one another as family, especially in the church, which is how St. Paul makes it explicit. Um, we're, we're a family. I mean, that is, that's the overwhelming, you know, arch word for how we belong to one another. We, we don't think about one another in that way. Yeah. If you study, if you study economics, mainstream economics, you'll see that one of the, probably the most fundamental concept that they posit is scarcity and scarcity against what? Scarcity against your own unordered, disordered desires. Uh, they never ask the question, is there enough 
for everyone to have a reasonable life? No, they said, it's not enough for you to have everything you want because you want everything. You want to be the richest man in the world. And so do I. Well, we can't both be. So we got to fight. Right. Um, Which that's our fundamental relationship to one another at that point is become. Right. And that's just absurd. As you pointed out about the about plants, it's amazing. They just, in a sense, it's almost like creation ex nihilo over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Think about the wood, for example, that grows every year. And then we take it and build houses, ships, all kinds of things out of it. And guess what? It's still coming. It's still coming. Yeah. I think the, 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 of God. The, the offense that we, the offense against God, when we have that attitude, and again, whether we think we're conservative, we think we're liberal, if we're formed by these, um, these philosophical backdrops, when, um, when we do that, we don't realize the offense against God that he made creation defective that he made the order of things has a defect and the defect is scarcity therefore let's take control take what's ours dominate where it's necessary and if you know if every now and then we got to dispatch a few and cull the herd you know we might have to do that uh but we, we don't think about we actually don't believe that the world is created uh whereas our actions create more abundance and fertility in other words we don't believe that that the order of the world is love no, it's very true. Of course, the, 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 since the 18th century, the, uh, in the United States, we have a, a curious fusion since the 18th century of Calvinism and Enlightenment Lockism, Lockianism. Uh, of, all the, of all the Enlightenment philosophers, Locke is the one that's had most influence on American thinking. But, but it's fused itself with this Calvinism, so it's made a very peculiar kind of, of worldview. And as I said before, Catholics have uncritically bought into it. Many Catholics have. Even they, whether they call themselves liberal, conservative, orthodox, they often are just their own version of, um, of uh, Lockeanism, of um, Calvinism, Calvinist Lockeanism. So you can see among liberal Catholics, for example, uh, a hesitation to think that the, uh, our sexual lives have any kind of implication for the social order. So it should be, everyone can do whatever he wants. And among people who might call themselves conservative Catholics, they have difficulty seeing that their economic activity has any, any implications for the common good. And so let's let everyone do whatever he wants. And they're both wrong. Both the, the economic appetite and the sexual appetite have to be oriented toward the common good, which happens to be what their own good is too. You know what the what the purpose of those those two aspects of human life is. Well, Thomas, I I'm going to have to end this because you are attempting to apply Catholic social thought and limit my freedom. So uh, <laughs> if if you're going to do such nonsense as that, I'm going to have to limit this podcast. And uh, and I've I've enjoyed it. I, uh, I I hope those that are listening did too. I hope it don't sound uh, like too impractical. Uh, I think that's why it's often dismissed, but I think what you're, you're showing and I really appreciate it is that actually this, you know, this is the water we swim in and we don't know it and we don't recognize. Uh, and I think a lot of times we're boxing the air because we're, we're hitting at enemies that are obvious to us. You know, th those of us that might see the obvious dogmatic, you know, look, if somebody's denying the immaculate conception, like it's just, it's, it's laughable. It, it's a joke, but the harder thing uh, for us in our households and our communities is to actually see one another uh, in these kind of ways that that uh, limit our freedom and force us to actually, you know, act like loving one another is important. Uh, I believe Jesus said something about that. So uh, thank you so much. Where can we uh, d do you have a regular blog or sub stack? Where can we point people? Well, I don't know. Good. <laughs> you can Fine. find a list of all my books. I have a I have an author page on Amazon. Not that I recommend Amazon that much, but I, but they did it, not me. Um, and you can find archives of my articles on some of the places I've written for online: the Distributist Review, Ethical Politica, uh, Practical Distributism. Um, all those, all those, those are going to be three main places. Great. Uh, I have a lot of articles of mine. All right, Thomas, Mr. Stork, thank you so much for being on Till and Keep Podcast. I really thank, thank you for having you. me. Next time we'll talk. This episode of Till and Keep has been brought to you by TAN, Fraternus, and Sword and Spade. 
Till and Keep is a podcast that shows how the primordial command from God to Adam to till and keep the garden applies whether you toil on a farm or in a concrete jungle. Visit tillandkeeppodcast.com to subscribe and follow the show. And use coupon code TILL25 to get 25% off your next order at tanbooks.com.